Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Today we are going to talk about the definitions, the most important and very often overlooked stuff. So, a canonical password strength measure. I have noticed uh, that the definition of the password strength has been missing for more than three decades by now. And in order to recover from this situation, we are going to do some embarrassingly trivial math with unexpected and fascinating results. We are all using passwords every day, and we seem to understand intuitively how to deal with them. So without give, uh, particularly uh, excuse me, particularly important notion of the password strength seems so natural, it seems so intuitive to us that without giving it a proper definition, we all seem to agree on the following statement. A strong password is difficult to guess. Well, it's quite reasonable statement, but it is unconclusive because we don't know what is difficult and what is guess. So the core statement of our intuition is merely shifting the problem of definitions. Our intuition is playing on words as it usually does. So my goal today is to overcome our intuition with few clean and simple formalities. I'm going to introduce a formal model of the guessing attack, demonstrate how few, how few properties does this attack possess. Capture all these properties in a single compact neat formula that is easy to handle, build a numerical measure that reflects the cost of the attack, and demonstrate that the very same measure at the very same time reflects our understanding of the password strength. I want to begin with the overview of the present situation in the IT industry. Bruce Schneier has captured the, has captured the state of the art in password security as the following. There has been a lot written on this topic over the years, both serious and humorous, but most of it seems to be based on anecdotal suggestions rather than actual analytic evidence. And I have stronger words to say. Based on my personal, uh, based on my personal <coughs> experience and the papers I have read, I want to say that the human understanding of the password security problem is as grim as medieval medicine. People absolutely aimless, they don't know what they do with this. And all popular password creation policies are patently examples of numerology and homeopathy. And I'm going to, supr to support this statement with the following examples. Here's the example by Google. Uh, tips for creating a secure password. Include similar looking substitutions such as zero for all, one for L, etc. Create a unique acronym and include phonetic replacement. It's not unusual, you everybody has seen similar recommendations nearly everywhere. Uh, well, as a, as a digression, I want to uh, pay attention to the word unique. Uh, does anybody sense an evil irony in the word unique in this context? In what set uniqueness must be assured? If in a set of all passwords, then I'm not supposed to know this set. It's very evil irony on the part of Google. The next example. Uh, similar recommendations by Microsoft. Do not use common replacements such as zero for, uh, zero for 
zero for O and one for L, etc. Do not use abbreviations and do not do common misspellings. So put them together and it is clearly it's easy to see that they are exactly mirror opposite to each other. So there are exactly opposite means to the same end. So do you still think that these two guys have any understanding of the password security? But in this particular argument, you may, you may want to give the victory to the Microsoft because their recommendations mm, more cautiously crafted, kind of lawyer style, they are negative. It's uh, very difficult to oppose a negative recommendation. But don't give it too much credit because the following example came from the same source. Microsoft say, one way to make your password memorable is to base them on the title of a favorite song or a book or a familiar slogan. I was shocked by this recommendation. It was very unexpected for me to read anything like that. And if you are not shocked yet, I have highlighted the keywords. The keywords are favorite and familiar. They totally undermine the, the idea of, secure, of password security. Uh, the research says that the fifth popular, uh, the, the fifth popular uh, password on open space is Blink182. As far as I understand, it is the name of a rock band which is relatively close to what Microsoft has just recommended. And everybody understands this phenomena because everybody seems, everybody is watching the same TV. Okay, next example is so numerous, uh, well, omnipresent, may I say, uh, online password strength meters. Uh, they are not an authoritative source of information, unlike Google and Microsoft, but they represent the mainstream culture. They do represent the public understanding of the problem, so we must pay attention to them too. First of all, they propose you a completely sinister idea to, sub to submit your password to a third-party entity. And they want you to think that after this submission, the strength of your password does not change. Which is um, a, a lateral topic to this presentation, but since it is a mainstream, I need to pay attention to this. And I want to mention explicitly LinkedIn.com, which tirelessly, persistently demands it demands you to surrender your email password to LinkedIn.com. And I assure you, very few people actually see any security breach in this action. But back to the topic. There is a research focused on online password strength meters. Oh, should I give you a word of warning? Uh, for brevity's sake, I do not supply full qualified uh, references to, uh, to this research I'm mentioning, but all the necessary references are listed in my, in my paper that is located on archive.org. You can read it if you want. Okay, back to the topic. This research absolutely unsurprisingly reveals that online password strength meters badly contradict each other. Of course they do, because nobody has the definition of the password strength. So it's just another illustration to the missing definition. But in one, in one particular aspect, all these strength meters anonymously agree. They always value stupid easy crackable, low entropy, ugly, poor memorable passwords higher 
then laborious, high entropy, high memorability, carefully chosen, neat, perfect passwords. So just try any, Google for any password strength meters and try these two passwords and I guarantee this player one will be valued higher than let's eat these pretty green apples, dude. Uh, question? But then you need to define strength because like player one is it's uh, much easier to, to remember than the let, let's eat this pretty green apple sprint. Actually, uh, quite opposite. It has more memor memorization strength. I'm going to talk about memori memorability of the password in the extra material for this presentation. Yeah, but but those online password means they don't define necessarily, necessarily what they mean with strength. So they could be a measure of how uh, memorable your password is instead of how strong your password is. No. A no and yes. Uh, this is no because they claim they measure the strength of the password. And it is yes because it is exactly my point. The result is delusional because they don't know what do they measure. They don't have the measure. They simply use a set of rules, a ru rules of thumb. Check for capitals, check for numbers, etc. And this is why this result. But the irony is that this result is, de is delusional even from the standpoint of the Shannon-based, uh, uh, entropy-based measures. Because the second password has more entropy. It's apparent to everybody. We can talk about it later. But exactly the entropy-based measures are the, the reason for this situation. They are the source of these stupid rules as check for capitals and check for numbers. And I'm going, you, and I'm going to show you why. First of all, we must understand what is Shannon's entropy. It is logarithm <coughs> of the number of expected outcomes. So it is inherently based on some sort of expectation which is a subject of assertion, assumption, whatever. And this measure is precise, is very precise uh, in the context of computer memory because the very design of the computer memory defines the set of expected outcomes. So this measure works in this context. We can measure amount of information in the, computer in the computer memory with this. But when we apply this measure blindly to the human generated passwords, then surprise, uh, the set of the expected outcomes turned out to be different and much smaller than we thought. They want me to create a perhaps as is my password a base 127 word but my mind does not work in ASCII. So my password is less, it is less than base 26. And they consider it a problem. And they take the simplest step to solve it. They force me to extend my alphabet. This is why they employ these stupid rules, check for capitals and check for, for numbers. Take another look at this situation. They took a very well established measure, applied it to something out of the scope of this measure. And the initial assumption on which this measure is based uh, turned out to be wrong. And instead of fixing this assumption, instead of reconsidering their own mistake, they forced me to, com to comply to their initially wrong assumption. Instead of fixing their measure, they want to fix me or you. This is the essence and the story of all this stupid stuff like check for capitals and check for numbers. And it took, it took about 30 years for a brave guy to state the following. Our findings were 
that the NIST model of password entropy does not match up with real password pa usage or password cracking attempts. The current use of Shannon entropy to model the security provided by human-generated passwords at best provides no actionable information to the defender. At worst, it leads to a defender having an overly optimistic view of the security provided by the policy, while at the same time resulting in overly burdensome requirements to the end user. And I want to add just one point about the futility of these best practices. You know what I'm talking about. And we're done with this overview part. The number of words over an alphabet A is cardinality of the alphabet to the power the length of the word. It is apparent that increase in length totally dwarfs any attempt to extend the alphabet. You don't have to be a mathematician to see this fact. But all best practices focus strictly on the extending of the alphabet. They constitute the weaker solution in the face of the much stronger one. Let's move to the real world numbers. Let's assume a user came to us with a seven word from English language. Uh, there are approximately 23,000 such words in English. It's a pretty good, it's very easy mark for a dictionary attack. So the policy mandates add a capital letter. How does the user respond to this policy? The user responds in the simplest possible way, which is in 98% cases is just two categories. It, it, the user response is divided in two categories, all caps or just the first capital. So our policy at a capital letter in 89% in cases multiplies the search space of the password by the mere factor 2. It's a neglectable result. Absolutely neglectable. And I want to play a giveaway. Let's assume that our users are not normal people and they use complete random capitalization of the password in response to this stupid policy. How many ways to capitalize a seven-letter word? 127 different ways. But, on the other hand, if you ask your user to give you a password of two words instead of just one word, you multiply the search space by the factor 23,000. So compare mentally sane and simple policy Factors 23,000, widely, widely adopted popular policy, cannot get better than 127 ever. So all these best practices are orders of magnitude weaker than a much simpler solution in the face of it. So the summary to the overview part is a bunch of morons is trying to teach us how to make a, a strong password without having a, without having a definition of the strength. And the sad part is that they succeeded. They have already built the entire building of password security in IT, missing the foundation. Everything is possible in IT, buildings without basements. So I'm going to fix it right now. And for the starter, I insist that there is no such thing as the password strength. What we perceive as the strength of a password is not a property of the password. 
It is a property of the password cracking attack. And it is very easy to prove. Let's take this password I cannot pronounce. Tell me, uh, can you determine its strength on its own merits? Can you tell me how strong this password using only this password for your calculation? Any ideas? Of course not. But what if I tell you that this password is extremely weak? It is weaker than any other password you've ever seen. Why not? I can crack it in no time, effortlessly, instantaneously, with a dictionary attack consisting of the single word, this word. You take this dictionary with this one word and you crack this password in no time. Do you have any objection to my proposition? So I state that on this premise, I declare this password extremely weak. Do you have any objections? Why not? I would have one. Yes, this is a dictionary of just one word. Why not? I am allowed to do this. Ah, that's closer, warmer. Who actually uses a ring table that includes this? Exactly my point. Who in his right mind would ever conceive <laughs> such an attack? This attack is insane and highly improbable. And I totally agree, this is, this is a valid objection. And this is why it proves my point. Because it is the argument from the attack. You used your knowledge about a potential attack to disprove my assumption. So, you inevitably have to reason about the attack if you want to assess the strength of a password. You cannot define the password strength in isolation from the, from the attack. You have to think what is feasible and what is plausible. Ideally, you end up with the theory of mind of the attacker. And then, the password strength follows up as the estimation of the cost of the attack, which is most probable or most expected. So we move on to the attacker's problems. And we need to clarify terminology. I hate it, but we need to do it. An alphabet is just a set, a word is a finite sequence of letters, and a dictionary is a finite sequence of unique words. By these terms, I do not refer to any natural language at all. Just for the time being, forget about, uh, about any natural languages. And by the word, the guess and attack, the word guess and attack implies that we target the password itself. Not the security system, not the hardware, not the software, not the personnel. We use only the legal interface to access the system. No hacking attempts. The access is unimpeded, no lockouts. Our resources, including time, are limitless. No CPU limitations, no memory limitations apply and the response of the system to our requests is restricted to, to yes or no. So the system does not reveal any information besides the specification. It just tells us whether the password fits. So we, we focus particularly on this attack and the only attack I'm going to talk about is a guessing attack. So it's kind of Unix way, one task at a time. <laughs> this is a front door attack. Forget about backdoors, vulnerabilities, exploits, everything. So move on to the attacker problems. This is the model of the attack. 
On the left you see the dictionary, it is ordered, and the attacker, can see, uh, attacker sends words from this dictionary one by one in the orderly fashion to the black box function which only checks if the given word is a password and responds with yes or no and the attacker collects the response. Once, once a password is found, the system responds yes and the attack stops. And we postulate, by the virtue of unlimited resources, that the dictionary always contains the unique desired password. Uh, it is very simple reason, and if it doesn't, we are always allowed to bloat it more, because we are not limited in memory. So, what do we have here? A black box function, I stress black box, a black box function that maps Oh, I, I want to point a, a black box function uh, that maps uh, words to the binary set and the iterative process uh, that iterates through the, through the dictionary uh, word by word and we yield and stops on success and then we yield the length of the attack. The, we yield the, Im the amount of iterations we had to perform. That's our attack. And it is always successful, and it is always finite. And the length we yield from this process crucially depends on the position of the password in the dictionary. As the password is allowed to appear on any position, the process will yield different length. So we may say that, well, if we assume that the attacker uh, looks to minimize the length of this process, which is pretty natural assumption. If the attacker looks to minimize the length of this process, then his strategy contains the order of his dictionary. And I want to show that, his that the attacker's strategy does not contain anything else. Let's assume that we can utilize some information retrieved from the response of the system. The only way we can utilize any information in the context of our attack is to remove some subset from the dictionary because our ultimate goal is to minimize the attack length which is essentially the cost of the attack. So I, I use length and cost interchangeably. So the only way we can utilize any information in this particular context is to shorten the dictionary. So let's say uh, we got some response and let's limit it to case one, all no response. Let's assume that we can derive some information from this response and then use it by removing something from our dictionary. Okay, it's, it's reasonable. It seems reasonable. Then we move on to all other cases which are opposite to the all no case. What is not all no means that there is at least one yes in the, in the response set. But by definition there is exactly one yes in the entire response. Which means there is no password in the given dictionary after this yes. Which means we are allowed to remove the very same subset from the dictionary because it is guaranteed to, to do not contain a password. So the premise that we can use information from the right side, from the response, leads us to unconditional 
removal of a subset from a dictionary. Which means there is no information on the right side. All the information about the attack is contained in the dictionary itself. So the attack is but a dictionary. It's quite a good result. It's, at least it is very simple. And we are going to simplify it still further. Let's take two different dictionaries. One is longer than the other, and they produce uh, the attacks of different length. If we apply this procedure, we can equalize their content, preserving the result. Since, at, since, the, both dictionary, uh, since the both dictionaries contain the password, and the attack stops when it encounters the password, we can take the difference between these two dictionaries and append this difference after the password so that the result is preserved but the difference between these dictionaries is reduced to reordering. Same content, different order. And there is no other difference between these two attacks. So I claim once a dictionary contains the password, the attack is but an order. Give it a little thought. This is a very concise result. Imagine that the attacker is limited to reorder his dictionary. All his choices, all his smartness, everything is limited to the reordering of his dictionary. There is no other options for the attacker. Apparently, many of the attack classification attempts are trash by now. So everything the attacker can do is to change the order in which he checks for your password. And in response to this attack, the defender must estimate this order. We suppose that the defender does not know the exact order and we want to build an approximate order. And I'm going to... So we move back to the defender's problem and I'm going to show you how to formulate this object, the approximate order. Imagine a dictionary. Here's the dictionary. It has an order. And the research reads, uh, top 100 words constitute 80% of passwords. Apparently, we can claim this similar, um, we, can, we can make the similar statement about any arbitrary top X. Top 10 of the passwords is the subset of top 100, and top 1000 is a superset, and by now you must see the nested set structure emerging. So we re enumerate these sets and simply write down the relation between them. And now you see that this nested set structure approximates the dictionary order. So we're going to use this formula. And it, the approximation works in very obvious way. All members of D1 precede all non-members. All members of D2 precede all non-members of D2, etc. for every element. So we have an abstract representation for the abstract uh, for the uh, for the password attack strategy. Uh, this formula captures everything we know about this attack and it reflects the partial knowledge. It reflects our partial knowledge. We don't know exact order. And this formula allows us to ask the pivotal question of 
today how, uh, how long an attack against my password is expected to be? And this question turns out to be very easy to answer. Let's suppose my password belongs to the element DK and does not belong any and does not belong to DK minus one. So we nail down the location of my password within this approximate order. It means uh, that the attacker have to have to iterate through the entire through the entire subset DK minus one without success. It is guaranteed, and we know the cardinality of the set. So we can say that any password located beyond the set DK minus one uh, delivers uh, the attack the attack cost the attack length longer than cardinality of DK minus one plus something, and how much, how longer. Here it is. Uh, after, after iterating through DK minus one, the attacker enters the subset in which our password is located. But we do not know the order within this subset, therefore we assume a random order. And the expected value for the attack length uh, with unknown order with random order is the following, one plus cardinality of the set divided by two. It's very simple, it's very easy to prove, but there is no need to burden the presentation with so trivial math. So finally we sum up these two values, and we have the expected value for the attack length, which is this sum, cardinality of dk minus one plus this fraction. This measure tells us how many passwords will be checked before my password. It tells us mm, how many passwords are likely to be seen as easier prey than the given password, which pretty much responds to our expectation of the password length of the password strength. This measure allows us to compare our password against other passwords. So, I want, I want us all to use this measure as the password strength against the given attack. And I emphasize against the given attack. Without without knowing the attack or without assuming the attack, without expecting an attack, we cannot define the password strength. So, finally, as I have promised, here's the attack strategy in a single neat formula. And the numerical measure that represents the password strength as a relation between the passwords and the attacks. And that's pretty much everything I wanted to say. So in conclusion, I want to highlight two relations between this measure and entropy-based measures. You may criticize the proposed measure uh, for, being, for being based on an assumption. And you're absolutely right. This attack strategy approximation on top of this slide is a big assumption. But entropy is also based on the assumption. In order, to, in order to calculate the entropy, you have to postulate the probability space to which your password belongs. And this is truly a wild guess. 
because this probability, this probability space does not have any physical meaning in the context of our problem. What does it represent? No answer. On the contrary, my measure is based on the very well substantiated assumption. This assumption approximates the real object. It has a profound physical meaning in the context of our problem. And you have all the necessary tools to keep this model in touch with the reality. So, instead of swiping under the carpet this assumption, as many trend makers do, I come out with this and I made it useful. Okay, the next relation is you can think about entropy based measures as a very optimistic estimate of the actual password strength. Entropy based measure assumes the entire search space for your password. And I add to this search space a particular structure which nails down the correct value. So I've started in a position to mm, entropy based measures and I end up in harmony with them by finding a proper role for them in this model. They are the optimistic estimations. And they are not inherently evil. We, sometimes we need optimistic estimations, pretty often. But they used to be very badly misused all the time. So all we know about password security is that we were using optimistic estimations of the password strength instead of the password strength. Okay, finally, in order to make this measure I proposed practical, uh, we need to conceive, imagine an ideal attack strategy. This is a topic of another speech, obviously, but I want to, I want to, I want to emphasize that we have all the necessary tools to perform this task. We have plenty of leaked passwords in connection with the password creation policies and we are watching the never-ending password popularity contest which tells us how to order our passwords in our dictionary. So we have the method and we have the data to make this measure practically usable or useful. Questions? Oh, maybe not. Maybe I want to tell you something. I want to tell you that I have just fixed the missing foundation problem. I have just created the theoretical basis for password security studies. And better late than never. Now questions. <laughs> if, you, if you don't have any questions, I have extra material. I always have extra. Well, awkward moment, no questions. Okay, let's move on to the extra. Um, I want you to make a huge leap and do not create do not create a, a, a model of uh, not model do not create a most feasible attack do not imagine it if you if you resort to the strategy I propose you can guarantee that your password is far far beyond 
any other password that is likely to be checked by any attacker, by any attack. Just make your password longer, really longer, as, as long as 7 to 10 words, sentence, like this one, 10 rainbow ponies feast on Pluto's corpse. It solves this password simultaneously solves all your problems. It gives you good memorability because yes, about memorability. It gives you good memorability because you designed it, not a machine gave it to you. You designed it. It's yours. It's very personal. And a sentence, a meaningful sentence, is exactly the way they teach us to memorize shorter passwords. Just save yourself a step and do not shorten it. Take it as it is, a whole sentence. And you, you solve another problem. You can hide bullshit characters in this uh, password. Numbers which are required by stupid policies. You can hide these numbers you, this sentence can accommodate these numbers naturally without damaging memorability. It also can accommodate capitals naturally the way you're supposed to use it in your, nature, in your native language and even punctuation. And then some passwords check and say, well, it's too long. It has to be 8 to 16 characters. Uh, to hell with this policy. Uh, if you limit your users, uh, such as the password no longer than X characters, well, you must, f you must not use this software because this software is sinister. <laughs>